All right, welcome uh, everybody to our Tuesday webinar from Wacom. We see that a lot of people are coming in right now, so we'll give everybody a couple of minutes. We're uh, pleased to uh, have Corey Steenstrow with us today. He's a renowned car designer, and you all out there have asked for uh, a car designer to appear, so that's what we're doing today. We've got a, we've got a pretty talented guy uh, who will be talking about car design, his career, how he got started, et cetera, and uh, we'll let the room fill up here, and uh, we'll get started in a few minutes, okay? Great. All right, so let's let's get started. I think we've uh, we've got enough people in here. Uh, hey there, Cooper. Good to see you. Um, he just said hello. So um, today's webinar is entitled uh, "So You Want to Become a Car Designer with Cor Steenstra." And um, as you know, Wacom has been around for quite a few years now. Thirty-five years we've been in the industry, and we've been hosting webinars throughout the pandemic just to uh, keep people active and um, keep people, uh, you know away from boredom, if you will. Um, so we've uh, done a lot over the years with uh, designers like Core, and uh, we're pleased to have him here today. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. This will be a, a session that can last up to two hours. It might not, um, but if we have a lot of questions and things, we'll be happy to uh, ask them. Um, if you do have a question, by the way, please put them in the Q&A, and I will ask Core the questions for you. It just makes things go a little smoother. Um, and due to time constraints, we may not be able to answer all of your questions, but uh, we'll try our best. Um, this Zoom session is also being recorded and will be put up on YouTube at a later date, uh, probably this evening, so you'll be able to see it there as well. Um, we also have some cool specials that we've been running. Uh, so those of you familiar with B&H, the catalog company in New York City, uh, they have a uh, nice discount on our Wacom One Creative Pen Display, $50 off. So that's something we're pushing uh, during this webinar. So uh, just a quick uh, little um, factoid on uh, Cor. Cor is originally from the Netherlands. Uh, he got into car design at a really, really young age. Um, he told us that he was uh, drawing cars at a, as a young child, anything basically with four wheels. Core was uh, Core was drawing, and that's pretty cool. So I, I mentioned that I was glad that he never grew up. So that that's <laughs> that's a cool thing about Core. Um, he uh, once he uh, kind of got really into it. He um, he went to the uh, Royal College of Arts uh, Transportation Design program in London, England, and after that he jumped right into the profession, uh, and he worked for such companies as Volvo, Mercedes, Mazda, and Hyundai. Uh, and he'll be showing us a lot about his career, um, so that'll be very interesting to everybody watching. Um, and soon his talents were kind of recognized here in the U.S., and he decided to uh, create an office in California. So he holds an office in the Netherlands and in the L.A. area. And uh, so now he's been drawing in both and contributing to a variety of car manufacturers around the uh, world. So it's really cool to see Core's work. Um, he's also uh, really recognized as being kind of a pioneer in the digital uh, design world, um, so that's cool too. Uh, we're glad to see that Core is a Wacom user and understands our products very well. So another reason why he was invited today is so that he can show you his skills at uh, uh, drawing. So we'll definitely get some uh, design work from him uh, during the webinar today. Um, he'll also take us through um, his history of designing, how he got a start, how he's got his start in the business. We were just going over some cute little stories before we uh, started the webinar, and he's got some cool stories to tell. And um, then that's it. So, uh, Core, take it away. We're glad to have you, and thanks, thanks for showing, and let everybody know how to get into car design. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Doug. And thank you everybody for attending and for watching. I hope it's interesting to you guys. Um, what I wanted to start with is that I um, I grew up in the Netherlands and the Netherlands uh, was not renowned as a big car country um, and still isn't. There's a, there's a lot of, uh, uh, the government is really trying to milk people for uh, getting as much out of cars as possible by raising tax, extra luxury tax on cars and everything. So not ex exactly car friendly. 
And so for me to become a car designer is something that was pretty rare at the time. My, uh, my um, school counselors didn't know what to do with me. I was always drawing, drawing cars and buses and race cars and all that sort of stuff. And they just looked at my parents and just said, well, we don't know. We don't know. Just give him something to do, but we don't know what to do with it. Um, so we, I didn't get any recommendation of, um, he didn't know anything about industrial design or anything like that. That was relatable. Uh, so for me, I just had to um, uh, just make my ends, just trying trying to get uh, trying to get there as I as I uh, went along. So I'm going to show you a little bit about the background here um, in my, this initial screen. Um, this is Netherlands, and I was born in the south and uh, raised basically in the center near Utrecht, and. Um, that's where my, my biggest passion came up initially, which was the passion for race cars, sadly with a 1973 with a big accent. But for me, the race cars, that the shapes of the race cars and the colors and the graphics on them was always something totally, totally interesting to me. So I really wanted to, um, um, yeah, that really brought a lot of passion uh, with me. So I, not knowing anything about it, I bought a scale model kit from Tamiya and I uh, built it and after I broke it down again and I measured everything and I started designing my own race cars. We had a Dutch race team at the time, uh, Hogenboom Bewaken, and I actually designed a car when I was 16. I developed a car um, that I showed them and they initially thought I knew what I was doing because um, it looked quite professional with all these sort of things on it, but I, I didn't have a clue. I was just guessing and um, for them, they accepted. But from that guessing and the drawing came the need to illustrate it better, to make it more attractive for the people to look at. So um, I decided to draw in cars and um, I made a this, this sort of uh, illustration for a design competition from a Dutch car magazine, um, uh, like a successor to the Saab 92. And actually this won the competition. And the nice thing for me was that the competition, the main prize was to go to, it, to uh, Italy and then to, amongst others, meet with Nuccio Bertone. And Nuccio Bertone looked at my stuff and he recommended me to go to Royal College of Art. So um, after finishing my studies in graphic design, I actually went to Royal College of Art in England and um, really got, uh, got a hold of what was really intended in the car design, how it really worked uh, by people who actually knew what they were doing. Um, after that, I switched over to, um, to Volvo um, and then I can go to another screen where you can better see this whole Volvo thing, uh, da -da -da -da, which is da -da -da, this one. If, if from Volvo, I was in from 1983 to 1988. And um, the first cars I worked on were the 300 series, which is the small originated from uh, Duff cars, but it um, uh, I did the facelifts on there for 1985 and 86. And meanwhile, we're working on the uh, sedan version of the, um, the Volvo uh, 440. And my main job basically, and my main claim to success at that time was working on the 480 convertible, the Cabriolet. Um, I did a heck of a lot of work on it. And I was really proud that it was going to be shown at the Amsterdam Auto Show in 1987 until it was canceled for that show last minute. Um, out of reasons, I think Volvo wasn't quite ready to show a convertible uh, from their range. But for me, this was like my pride and joy, basically, at that time. Um, after that, I switched over. Oh, I worked on concept cars with Volvo as well. Uh, thankfully, my boss allowed me to, uh, to experiment a little bit with different shapes. Uh, so I really was looking for something totally aerodynamic, which was not exactly what Volvo were doing back in those days. Uh, they had actually quite rigid square blocks and then this was something totally different and i wanted to cover the wheels as much as possible because i thought that was aerodynamically more interesting and then this uh, vertical stabilizer because if you have an aerodynamic shape and you drive at high speed you want to go uh, you want to have stability while you're driving on the road so that was my logic at that time back in 1986. Um, from that i changed over to mercedes-benz uh, in Germany. And at Mercedes, I initially was involved in the uh, W210, which is the E-Class, so that came out as the E-Class in the end. And then I uh, worked on several other projects. 
amongst others, I did uh, my passion for race cars kept on coming up. So I initiated a project myself for a Mercedes uh, Formula 3 sized uh, car with bodywork on it so that uh, the drivers could get trained in both driving single seaters, um, but also with bodywork. So it's a bit safer than an open wheel car. Uh, but it also would prepare them for Group C uh, races where Mercedes was venturing out into at that time. And of course, I tried out the graphic design because I love doing race car graphics. Um, and I worked on hey, the... In hey, initially Cor, we, the have, we have a couple of questions. Can okay. I ask, ask a couple of questions just to interrupt no real quick? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, uh, Cooper here says, what can you expect to pay when hiring a car designer for a small startup? But you have to pay for a, a car designer. Yeah. Um, I think if you are starting out as a, as a startup, if you don't have much money, uh, you should not do this. Um, the fact is that um, what I found is that when, when people try to start a company with uh, too little money, um, then ultimately the project will run out of funds and you will only get frustration from any side that, you, that you're working with. So the main priority with a startup initially would be to get as much money as possible and then get the job done properly. Uh, if you then um, decide to go for design, um, you better have a good designer and you better have a really good design when you start out because otherwise uh, it will show. And then your project won't be taken as seriously as, you, as it should be. And therefore, ultimately, it will not be as, success, as successful if it will take off in the first place. I found that even with when they hire renowned designers, if the budget isn't there, most of the time, that's the reason why it fails. Even big renowned startups uh, have issues afterwards. So that's the, the, the main thing. Sure, cool, thanks. Um, let's see, uh, then John has a question. I am building a model car now. I would like to do a 3D scan of that model so that I can make duplicates. In a perfect world, I would like to upscale that model to a full size model. How do I pull it off? <laughs> well, again, lots of money. Um, but initially, at least you, you can make a scan. If you set your scanner as, as detailed as possible, um, then whatever you blow up to, um, I don't know what the scale of the model is, but if it's a 10 scale, you should blow it up 10 times. Your radii will, of course, get softer from the original model, but you can adjust that in a, uh, uh, when you make a service model from it. And then the service model, you can uh, um, mill out again, and then you have it in, in full size. That's uh, the only thing is that the cost of milling is normally quite uh, uh, quite extensive because you want to do it you want to do it properly, you want to do it accurately, and the material already to build it up is is quite uh, uh, expensive. And then to have the machine a uh, five axis machine run and accurately uh, do the work for you, and after to have modelers make it uh, optimize the model and make it into a perfect clay model or uh, that always money okay great thanks yep all right continue great yeah thanks. um yep. so this was when i start when i towards the end of my time at mercedes i was uh, uh taking lead initially on the w220 which was going to be the new s class and um i came up with these these ideas of making it um, a little bit different, and uh, I think ultimately that might have inspired uh, going to the Maybach version of the Mercedes, uh, because I think there was always a, a, I think there was a need to go upper class from, from the Mercedes S class. I didn't think that the S class should be the top of the line, I always thought there was something worthy to go higher, and that's why I uh, was suggesting these sort of uh, classical lines, and that's when I'm going back to, uh, to the origin. At Mercedes, I was also uh, working on the C111, which was based on the C110 and on the um, on the Group C car that won the championship at that time. Um, my interpretation was a, a little bit more yeah, stylish, I think, for that. And I worked on what was supposed to be the successor to the Galende wagon, the G-Wagon, G which is now still out, apparently, but it's uh, at that time they want to replace it. And my, my design at least was chosen for a lot of things that in the end flowed into the M class. Um, but that was after I left Mercedes already. I was then uh, hired by Mazda Europe. And at Mazda, I uh, worked on a variety of different cars. Once up the Mazda 626, I did, um, I came up with that whole idea of these 
fender that would go uh, round, uh, the sort of oval shape there. Um, and I think ultimately that sort of thing stuck in the head uh, 10 years later for the RX-8 uh, to come out. That had the similar sort of theme around the fender cone. But um, at Mazda, I also worked on the, uh, the J70 amongst others, this uh, ultra luxury sedan, um, Mazda 1999 successor. We had lots of different projects at Mazda. It was a really interesting time. And this was also the first time I started, uh, I was confronted with um, what was possible on the computer. This was 1993 and they had a Mac with Photoshop and my the first Wacom tablet that I ever worked with. And I took a photograph of the existing 929 and I blew it up and I started editing it in Photoshop just roughly. And I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Nobody taught me anything, but uh, it actually came out quite convincing. So we, we used that combined with the full-size tape drawing and made a quite interesting presentation of the design basically. But that was my first uh, venture out into uh, using the computer for 2D stuff only. I was told then by Alias Wavefront at the time that uh, you could actually use the software that they use for uh, Jurassic Park. You could use that to build actually car models, but they couldn't show that. They went, they had a demonstration at Mazda where they were showing how to build a, a spoke of a wheel. And it took them two days to build it and then six months to get it milled out. Uh, but I thought, well, if nobody knows how to do it, maybe I should try and do that. Uh, this was a, another master project. But then I went to, oh, this is the master bongo, by the way. Uh, this is for the Japanese market, a small delivery vehicle. Um, that I think the initial sketches were done in 91 and ultimately came into production, I think 94, 95 in uh, Japan in a different, a different variation, of course. But uh, this was one of the uh, key designs for it at the time. Um, so I left Mazda with that knowledge of that uh, Elise Wavefront thought that you could make a car models uh, with their software. So I delved into that, invested everything that I owned into a silicon graphics computer and buying the Alias Wavefront software and buying my, my first Wacom, uh, um, what is it, Intuos UD tablet, uh, yeah, which, uh, the, which the was interior, totally, yep. totally interesting to me. Um, so I could, I was actually in 1994 at the Geneva Motor Show. I was showing at the Dongleport stand how I drew on the computer, then cut it from the Macintosh over to the Silicon Graphics, and then Silicon Graphics had to build in alias the model and then show the photographs, the photorealistic photographs of it as well. So that was, um, uh, I think I was the first one to ever show that at that time at the Motor Show. It was even mentioned by famous journalists at that time in books and that sort of thing. So that was quite, quite cool. Um, because of that, I got a lot of different work from different clients. This was for Toyota. I was, um, uh, I think this is 96 or 97. Um, they had the fun cars that were gonna show the Frankfurt Motor Show. And I had three weeks to make uh, all three models and animate them. So that was a very little sleep and a lot, a lot, a lot of work, but uh, I got it all done on time. And uh, the client was happy at the time. So that was a good learning lesson. Um, I went to uh, Duff Trucks and uh, helped them there uh, install all that uh, same design um, hardware and software that I was using myself uh, and taught them how to, uh, how to implement it in the most efficient way to reduce the lead time. So here at that time, I was using Painter for drawing and then afterwards, uh, the modeling in alias, and then the rendering, and then we milled the data out and we got the, the truck model uh, for the interior amongst others, for the race truck, for lots of different things from Daft Truck. We were experimenting and we set it up properly and it worked really efficiently, so that was really cool. Then at, um, I was also approached for another motor show for the Amsterdam Auto Show. Um, and I decided to make something interesting as a promotional thing, going back to my passion for Formula One cars. I made this one um, as to totally free form about uh, just knowing what the package should be and what the, where the cockpit would be and that sort of thing, but not for any manufacturer. Mm -hmm. But this then caused uh, Philip Morris to ask me for their, um, what was it, their, their Formula Three race the, uh, at Sanford. 
to do a special display with a Philip Morris branded Marlboro car. Um, so I develop, developed that thing as well. So my passion of, for racing, and that's something always stayed in. I came back to Donkervoort, um, the car that initially showed the four wheel floor, the, 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 the old fashioned layout with the front wheel and rear wheel drive, front engine rear wheel drive. And I may suggested this one for uh, Joop Donkervoort as a mid engine sports car suggestion. Um, he was going to switch engines from Ford to Audi. And I thought, well, that would be a brilliant way to get a mid engine, uh, small mid engine car, high power uh, on the road in a unique Donkervoort style. So I was trying that thing. And um, any motor shows, I was also then showing how you can render on the computer. So these sketches on average took about 20 to 30 minutes um, while the audience were watching and the audience was complaining about that, that the kids could do it better, faster, and, and that sort of thing. So uh, you learn from that sort of stuff of what to do. But, uh, uh, it was interesting to just get some stuff out of you, basically. Then um, I went on to, uh, to America, and one of the things there was, for instance, for um, a company called Metalcraft is here, to do some variations in large boats. Uh, so like the Plymouth Prowler variation on that, or the Peter Cruiser, or the, uh, what is it, that, um, uh, what is it, Piper, different front ends and that sort of thing on that, all using Photoshop. In 2001, I was at the uh, Detroit Motor Show showing this concept for what it looked like a Volkswagen Beetle-like uh, car, but it's actually symmetrical front and rear. So you can take panels out and change them from front to rear completely. So you have a um, very low parts count by comparison to a normal car. And you can develop this car into, uh, you buy them as a two-door when you're young, and then you can take it all your life changing the configuration as you need it with your family and that sort of thing. So there was a whole concept behind it. And um, I thought it was neat. at least it's something interesting to do. Um, when I when I grew up, my, my father was working for the Dutch railroads and I, I therefore always was drawing uh, trains and that sort of stuff as well. So when this came along to do some uh, uh, Megra trains for uh, uh, some airport uh, shuttles for I think at trains at that time, this was quite an interesting thing for me to just uh, try out as well. And then small things like industrial products like caps, um, at that time trying to find new ways of holding it and being more economical than uh, what was current, what was at that time current. And then uh, of course more, uh, it, this was for Hyundai, like a small concept uh, vehicle for uh, Roadster. Um, so all sorts of different type of things just to keep the, the clients happy. Um, this is what came out of that one that it never went to production. Um, this was for a, a former truck manufacturer in America called Hendrickson that now is making suspensions and they wanted to have an, uh, just an a illustration based on the heritage of what uh, a Hendrickson truck could look like now to show their suspension units. So I made that sort of an illustration uh, developed from their heritage basically. And this was my idea for Cars for the Stars, a theme where we were gonna use a um, existing platform and then build up um, some nostalgic Duesenberg type or core type uh, vehicles for uh, exclusive clients if they had the money for it. So Cars for the Stars. Uh, this is an, that shows a little bit um, um, the way that I used my used to draw in the sense of this is uh, normal sketches uh, on paper, and I used a lot of uh, pencil and some marker with it to, to get the basic shapes going. Uh, ultimately, uh, in uh, using digital uh, technology, you can replicate this completely and do uh, be much more efficient uh, in the sense that if you make a line wrong digitally, you can always add it undo, but you can't do it in uh, real life. So that's uh, that was my main advantage when I was starting to switch over. The other advantage is when we, um, I used on vellum at one stage. With vellum, we used a heck of a lot of chemicals like glare marker fix. And um, that stuff would get into your nostrils. And I think that we're going to lose years from having used that stuff. Now we can game effects that we used with glare marker fix. We can get it digitally with no health risks at all. So I thought that was quite, a, quite an improvement with the digital technology.
this was for uh, the Nissan Infinity uh, concept, and then we did it for this for Suzuki. Uh, some initial ideas for um, I think this was 3000, and some more ideas for pickup trucks. I think for a client here in California, um, where we just use brainstorm sketch crazy and then just color it quickly just to get uh, some ideas flowing. And then the, the best ideas of that we develop into renderings in all in 2D. And when the client then uh, likes it, we can go further into 3D stuff, uh, switching over to uh, alias and uh, do that. This was done for the 10th Jubilee of my own company, where I wanted to make a, um, a vehicle that was very much California-like, but still uh, nimble and um, a bit European-like. Not, not the American part, the California part is this sort of split in colors, but the rest of the proportions are very European. And then we make a little baqueta type of thing with, um, uh, yeah, with just a fun to, fun to drive car here in California. Uh, that was the part with Hendrickson suspensions. And then we go to another uh, part. This is the more recent uh, work that I've done. And let's see if I can switch over one second. Uh, this one can go to here. Does it work? There we go. This is the showing more recent stuff. This is for uh, Duff, back to Duff. We, in 95, Duff did some, uh, I want to go racing with that truck. So we did uh, develop the race trim and the interior that you've seen already. Also, come. Um, I also worked with uh, Metalcraft, uh, the design of the Icon Air A5. Um, initial design was done by Nissan Design in uh, San Diego, La Jolla. And then it came to uh, Metalcraft just to get everything optimized and get everything realized for production. Uh, so that's what I was working on then in uh, using Alias. Yes, this was for a company in um, uh, Houston, Texas. The owner of the company wanted to have a, based on a Honda motorbike, he wanted to have a tricycle where he could put his hand out on this fender like he did on a boat. So that was the main main thing. He had the frame already built. He had the layout already ready, but he wanted to have something where when he sat in the front and his wife would sit in the back, he could put his arm out here on this area like he did on a boat. And the rest, I was uh, just asked to just make something out of it. So this is what he chose ultimately. Um, and that is in production, I think. And uh, actually they've been racing with this as well. Uh, this is for uh, Hot Wheels. Uh, Hot Wheels was at one stage thinking about doing a MOOC. And there were several designs that uh, they wanted to have uh, built into models uh, for full-size milling and full-size um, uh, movie cars. This is a concept I built uh, on my own for um, an electric uh, trash truck, where I thought that I wanted to hide away as much of the, the dirty bits um, and then have it as clean as possible. And I also make the cab narrower so the drive would sit centrally and with a lot of glass so the driver could have contact with the people in the street, uh, which then mean that uh, it would be a bit more friendly in the neighborhood when that thing is driving around. It wouldn't make much noise because of electric engines. It would have this uh, this system here at the far to lock the the big containers and put it in in the back, and everything would else be quiet, clean, and simple. Um, I would thought that was um, uh, the future trend for uh, uh, trash con trash collecting here in the in area. At one stage, we had a celebration for um, uh, my company for I think twenty years at that time. And I want to make a concept based on the Alpha 4C platform, uh, but I was stopped by Chrysler uh, to do that because I thought this would be an interesting thing in, 19, in 2014 to make on the base of the Alpha 4C, but make it into American Chrysler-based SRT version or something like that. Um, but Chrysler didn't want us to do anything like that, so we stopped that mid-development. Uh, mid um, this was an idea for a narrow lane vehicle where it's basically a tandem seating uh, exaggerated now with the wheels, but the original very narrow, and then very narrow wheels and tires and suspension. And then with that, you could drive uh, on the freeways in a, what do you call it? In a, um, you could split the carpool lane in two 
and then you wouldn't take up as much space and therefore you would be much more space efficient with uh, the limited uh, network, the limited uh, infrastructure that was available. And then uh, it would be much more efficient for uh, the, for the, how do you call it, for the traffic going back and forth. This was an idea also electric because I've been doing a lot of electric stuff. Um, this was an idea for a limousine seat where you can see there's uh, uh, three rows of seats with three people next to each other uh, and still, but the car is wider, so it's uh, pretty spacious inside still. And then the central seating position and then the galling doors. So for long distance, uh, it, would be, um, it would be ideal um, and it would be a bit more interesting than getting into a traditional limous limousine like we have these days. This was uh, based on the Mercedes S-Class, uh, the Royale 600. Also a, a concept that was based on a couple of sketches and then we uh, developed it as uh, things came along. This was an armored vehicle concept. Um, multiple vehicle concepts for a company called Mega EV in Huntington Beach. Uh, also interior for a bus with the seat development. So as a car designer, or as a designer, basically, I like to do lots of different things. I, I go to interior, exterior, and uh, trains, buses, cars, race cars, whatever I can. Um, and then you can do experiments with little uh, monitors and that sort of thing to get the overview of the vehicle, basically, in this bus case. And at one stage, this bus uh, got produced. The graphics here were not my idea. Um, the graphics here were just to show that there was carbon fiber in the bus, but the original bus it was like, and um, I thought it was, this was intended for the Chinese market, uh, with again, central driving position, and then luxury travel um, long distance. Uh, another uh, bus concept, where you can see the comparison with other buses as well, they're trying to look a bit more modern, a bit more um, classy by, by, by while still not uh, compromising on the um, you know, on the efficiency of the vehicle itself. So I thought that was uh, then some experiments with uh, shapes, aerodynamic shapes. Uh, I like to use, for instance, in uh, um, digitally, I like to sketch uh, some shapes and then go to alias and experiment trying to get those shapes into uh, 3D form and then make something out and you can do a heck of a lot of stuff. I did a lot of work with Faraday Future. One of the, when they asked startups, that startup, I think we were, I was working there 2015 and it's still not completely there. And they had $2 billion available initially. So um, money isn't everything, but at least money does help to get you somewhere. Uh, the idea for a bus uh, based with a tractor trailer combination. Uh, this was for Fisker for the, uh, their sedan concept, the Fisker Emotion. This was the mirror designed for it. Uh, here, the wheel designed for that thing, the complete exterior model and interior model. And um, that's interior. And this car was initially another concept of mine for like a small mail vehicle that, initially, that ultimately was picked up by a Chinese mail company and then made into this version with some changes, of course, to make it fit uh, their specific needs. But um, that's when you do some concept things and, and uh, a potential client suddenly sees and picks up, picks it up, and then you think, oh, that's quite, uh, quite useful for them. So you never know how things end up. This was um, for a Germany that wanted to do last mile delivery and uh, um, did an experimental concept with that and animations of how that should work. And then we worked on some uh, autonom autonomous vehicles for a Chinese company. So we had some proposals and um, made the exterior and interior uh, designs. And they were, uh, I think they were finished, but then uh, they went to a company that should make it. And that company apparently didn't, couldn't do it properly. So I think that was uh, changed dramatically afterwards. Uh, I also worked on a lot of uh, Megra vehicles. Um, for airport shuttles again, different variations on that. And then uh, the idea of making, for instance, using maglev vehicles to get containers uh, away from the harbors really quickly. 
so that you would have a quiet and uh, efficient uh, way of doing it without these big diesel trucks going back and forth the whole time or these trucks moving slowly in all uh, infrastructures. So this would be the more efficient solution. And based on that, uh, do the MacLev freeway where people would actually then as a future infrastructure concept where people could drive onto um, a little MacLev platform that would drive them from wherever they are to wherever they want to be. And after that, afterwards they could take over again, which would allow people who even don't have expensive cars and not are filthy rich to be uh, uh, environmentally friendly and uh, cost efficient and time efficient uh, to move, for instance, from um, uh, LA to San Francisco in uh, in under an hour or in one and a half hours, and then without any without any emission and pollution. Uh, I thought that was a good uh, basic idea of the Mac freeway concept. I did some um, uh, buses for airport shuttles and luxury transport. Um, uh, concept for a, uh, this is actually in production for a, uh, a camper based on this uh, Mercedes thing and some more other. And then um, here I did autonomous trucks with aerodynamic shape, ex exterior and interior. And the uh, emphasis was really on the aerodynamics, so the optimized aerodynamics was given. And then afterwards, the um, I tried to make it look a bit more interesting. So again, central driving position um, and the cap as uh, fluid as possible. Hiding the wheels, that's actually uh, a realistic option and something that could be taken into production. Um, and I thought that was to make, compared to the current trucks in America, this would be something totally radical. So it would be interesting to do. Um, idea for a um, supercar, zero emission. And this is the last thing that I have in my portfolio is for Volkswagen during the pandemic had this competition going on uh, for the ID3 from 2015, 2050, 2050, and um, based on a new electric vehicle. So I took part in that as one of the prize winners in that thing as well. So that was a little bit of my history. Um, I don't know if there are any more questions at the moment. Oh yeah, we have quite a few questions. Um, okay. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, let's get some of these answered. Um, that was super interesting. Corey's had quite the uh, career. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that was really good to, good to see. Uh, let's see, I, I, people are wondering if you um, still render and work the old fashioned way with traditional media or do you go all digital now? Um, I, I still catch my sketching and doodling, um, especially during meetings or when I'm uh, somewhere else, just using pen and paper. Um, and I have my, admittedly, my uh, iPad as well. Um, Procreate on the iPad I use, I, I use, but I don't use it as much as I, uh, as I use this uh, sketchbook on the, on the PC. Um, I prefer when I'm out just to have only my... Uh, a little magical thing, a uh, little hard board to carry a couple of sheets of paper and then a ballpoint pen and just uh, doodle along um, so that at least my thoughts get out immediately. Cool, cool. Uh, another question, do you, do you have a favorite car and what do you drive, <laughs> right, what do you drive right now? At the moment, I've rented a Toyota Corolla. Um, I've got another car, it's a uh, no, um, what is it? Um, uh, no convertible. Um, and my favorite working on, I'm still trying to get it out of production. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to be very pro Ferrari, but I think at the moment they're a little bit too, um, um, how do you call it? I would say a little bit too gimmicky in their design. Uh, same as Lamborghini, I think they went a little bit overboard with all the tip up, up, all the little details and flaps and that sort of thing. I like it a bit more elegant and a bit more um, sophisticated. Cool. Uh, in your in your opinion, what are the greatest uh, car designs ever? Um, I do have a preference for um, uh, Italian Giugiaro. He has some really really nice cars uh, in the the late sixties, early seventies made that were really some Batona designs were cool to me, really inspiring. Uh, amongst others, the Lancia Stratus Zero um, is always stuck in my mind. I think the Caimano from the design was uh, uh, significant for me. Um, but for the rest, uh, 
there's there's a lot of inspiration stuff, but it's nothing that I would um, yeah I would sleep sleep over in that sense to to uh, that I really need to have I need to own. I think one of the closest things is in production at one stage was the Ayasutsu Piazza, which came out as a uh, which basically very close to Pantar from Ethel Design at the time. And that came into production, and we had a test view called Volvo in 1985-86, and I loved driving that car. It was just driving like a like driving a concept car. Cool. So as, as I figured, we'd have a lot of questions on how to get into uh, car design. So I'll I'll take a few questions from people and kind of combine them. Um, people are wondering, you know, how did how to get into the industry and tips for uh, creating your portfolio, things like that. Can you offer some hints? Yes. Um, first of all, it depends on where you are and if you have colleges in your area. Um, what I found at that time is that uh, when I was young, I didn't know anything about car design. I didn't know anything about um, any sort of education in that direction. So I was do learning from reading car magazines. These days with the internet, you can see a heck of a lot already online and learn from there. Um, which will give you a good, good um, um, basis. If you can get to that sort of level uh, by yourself, then it's a good start for making a portfolio for um, going to uh, any college. But I do recommend that you would ultimately a college, um, either uh, Art Center in TCS in uh, or Royal College of Art or Pforzheim in Germany. Uh, those are the colleges, uh, they do help you uh, first of all, they help you in getting uh, to the right uh, right job, and you get the you get to meet the right people from the industry as well. But it also helps you build up a whole network of people that you studied with, um, who you will know for the rest of your life. And I know that from practice. I've the people that I studied with, I'm still in contact with uh, now, and that's uh, now 40 years later. So that's that does last, and that's that networking is really important. Cool, cool. That's great. Yep. Um, somebody has a question about uh, this might have to do with uh, copyright and stuff like that. Uh, they say, is it legal to put a badge on a sketch uh, if you're say say you're aiming for a particular design like uh, Jeep versus Tesla? Uh, how do you how do you make a concept design right? How many views, interior, environment, etc. Um, does that question make sense? It's kind of convoluted there but there's a lot of things in in one question um if i if i make sketches and i just write here jeep with the jeep logo yeah there's no issue at all because i'm doing that that's my my own prerogative if i publish uh something with that then um i need to have permission from from fiat chrysler auto or stellatus Stellantis at the moment just to use that but at the, um, if it's just for you and and your portfolio going to college that sort of thing there's no issue at all. Um, it's just that if you publish it and, and use their name and use their brand for your own uh, benefit, then you um, you have to really uh, watch out. You have to really uh, make sure that you're okay. Um, the other question was for interior and, uh, what was it, interior and layout? Uh, they were saying, um, how, how do you, well, I guess, I guess they're saying, how do you come up with your concepts for uh, interior design? Okay, that's... Uh, that's a good, good question. I'll, I'll do that now. I'll show you. I normally start with a little package, and normally it, that's the side view. So I, I or the wheels. I roughly I will know where the wheelbase is given on the given the technical dimensions from the client. Yeah, based on that, I just draw the wheels and I, I draw roughly where I want the people to sit. So I know there's going to be a steering column. I know there's going to be uh, seats. I don't know how they're going to sit. If it's a two seater or four seater, in this case. I would say it's a four-seater, and I want it a little bit of a relaxed uh, driving position. So I take a, I just draw a sketch in a little mannequin. But after I will use a completely accurate 95 percentile mannequin. But initially for my sketches, I just want to know roughly where I am. So this is the initial position, and I have, for instance, here a layout for what I would think could be for a pickup truck. Uh, you can you can draw in the the people in the back for a minivan. So if I do this, and then I have extra seats here and extra seats between the wheels here, smaller seats, I can make a minivan type of layout. And I based on that, at least I can 
uh, both from exterior and interior, say, okay, I'm going to make something, I'm going to draw something like this. I can go to the uh, layer um, tab for a second here. Yeah. Oops, I can make a new layer. Sorry, your screen is in the way. Here. Um, and I can make this layer a little bit less. So on the new layer, I can now use the same um, on and say, okay, I'm going to make a car that has about this sort of interior space. See, where maybe I chop off a little bit of the head and the, of the chin and the bed, it's not important. And then try to come up with something original. The, the window, front window as far forward as possible. And then a realistic front overhang. So that's for the exterior. For the interior, I can also then immediately say, well, the door's going to be here. So I know that the window's going to be there. So that means that I will want to have my arms rested somewhere so I can make a line where I want to rest my arms. So I can make a principal layer. Okay, this is going to be the initial design area for the, for the front. And then I have the IP here, and you draw the section for the IP. And if you have that basis, then you can start thinking in, in 3D. So you have this sort of technical layout roughly, and based on that, you can make your own um, uh, assumptions. And then based on that, you can start sketching because you can take this section and say, okay, I want to therefore in, in 3D use this as a, um, the IP coming down, the center console going over there. The IP is theoretically going all the way. So you can take a section here over the, where you have the, the drive controls and that goes over to this area here. You make a center line, you, you draw the steering wheel area, make a little nice segment here. And that way you can just start sculpting in, in a 2D of what you're thinking about in, in that side view. So it's, it's, the logic is always there for me that you always start with what you actually want to do with the technical layout. So you know roughly what you're working with, especially coming from race cars. Um, I always like to know that I'm I'm doing something useful and not that I'm just wasting uh, wasting space. Uh, I want to have something that is functional on all in all segments. Yeah, that's great. That I think that answers the question. Yeah. Um, let's see what's next here. Uh, what's your What's your dream? Uh, oh no, we've already answered that. Uh, <laughs> when so uh, thoughts of uh, on lo-fi cyber truck design. Do you have any thoughts of that? Lo-fi cyber truck design. Lo-fi, yeah, L-O-F-I, cyber truck design. I don't know. I don't know what lo-fi means. Sorry. Low fidelity. Clue. At least, at least on the on the cyber truck in itself, I've seen what um, uh, Tesla has been doing with their uh, their their big truck, their wheel truck truck, and then their um, sort of uh, edgy. Um, other that that sort of pickup truck version for them. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if that's a lo-fi one, but that was to me aesthetically very very difficult to accept. I see the logic with the their metal uh, limitations to, of for the metal that they're using, and I know why they're using their metal because their rockets are. But that seems like a, such a far-fetched compromise to make that I it makes a statement, but it's not like something that uh, sounds like a good excuse enough to me. Yeah, I think that's true with a lot of car designs, right? You have uh, people that are get, are way out there and they're not functional. They look cool, but they're not functional, right? Well, that's the thing. That's that's where you want to. Uh, uh, of course, you want something that is totally. Um, you want people to go to the showroom because they are in awe of the design that you make. On the one hand, on the other hand, they do open the door at one stage and try to get inside, and they try to be comfortable inside. So if that doesn't work, if you only have something really cool. But you can't get in, and it's not practical. Then it's useless. Like for instance, that um, what was it? The Lamborghini um, Countach looks spectacular. You come to the show, wow, supercar! But it's so freaking low. And then when you sit inside it, you can't uh, see over your shoulders to reverse the car. You have to really climb out half the car with the doors open to reverse it, which is totally pathetic. And then that's that's just uh, that doesn't make it uh, like a realistic option to me. 
Yeah, that, that's true. I, I I agree with that. You see that you see that a lot in the car industry. Um, another person is uh, studying car design right now, and they're wondering when they should transition or should they transition from traditional drawing to uh, digital. I mean, I've been to a lot of uh, car manufacturers around the country, and uh, pretty much everybody is working digitally now. So, um, well, what are your thoughts there? Way. Let's put it this way. I found that um, when I was younger, I, when I, especially in Holland, we only had markers and we had um, um, letters at paper. So I used to my, I used to use ballpoint pen and marker, and um, I learned that way to build up. And then I found that oh, if I do uh, what is it, pastel crayons, I could get a little bit of uh, shading on it that looks like an airbrush. Or if I really have time and I want to go through trouble, I can use an airbrush. Uh, but I, and therefore, I learned how to use all those materials. When I then went to uh, Mercedes, um, they had vellum, American vellum paper. And with the vellum paper, I, I learned how to use that with, you can use the front and the back of it. You can, uh, it's much more solid than normal paper. So you can use, um, uh, you can use on the front and the back, you can use markers and pastel and get different effects. And then when I switched to Mazda, I actually found out that uh, if I do, um, layers if i now for instance have um if i have the pastel crayons and i i spray it on here like in a little color like here for instance on this say this is glass here if i do this in itself it comes out really light and that's on paper and on initial um uh, vellum you get this sort of effect but if i then uh, want it more intense in uh, on vellum i could actually then use blair marker fix spray it over it and then let it dry and then go again with that same pastel over it and build it up and do that 20 times until it got really intensely good here. But meanwhile, you, you spray that stuff all over yourself in the studio, of course, and that's poisonous. So that wasn't really the best solution. And But I learned how to do that. I learned how to build it up. And therefore, for me, it's much easier now to use the digital tools because I learned how to use the traditional tools. And I use everything that I learned as a uh, from the from the traditional method. I still use today. So, uh, but I used in the in the um, how do you call it? in a digital fashion. So, if I now what I did, for instance, in that that design that made that uh, Saab ninety two design that won me that design competition in nineteen seventy nine, I used uh, vellum paper, and the vellum paper had a color roughly like this. So that the advantage of that was it's an Italian method, I thought at that time. So the advantage of that would be that I could um, sketch some uh, car shape in black. Wait, wait, take it up in black. I'll do it again with. I'll do this really rough, just quickly. But um, so this was the this was the car shape. And I can then use uh, white to sculpt out the, the initial form of that car. So I go back and I go this way. And that this was all done in pencil at the time. So white pencil and then white uh, on, on a colored paper. And you could get that sort of shape going on. And then I could take the, a little bit of a dark color and I get the main body here. Well, the advantage now is that I can do all this digitally without having to go to the vellum paper, to the to the uh, Kenson paper, and building it up that way. And I can just play around with all these sort of experiments uh, digitally now, ideally. But um, I needed to have that sort of initial knowledge for me to use that. So I think it's really essential that you you learn all the techniques that are there in the traditional method, and then when you're um, when you have them under control, you try to repeat those in uh, in uh, in a digital manner. Sure, and with with car manufacturers being very international as well and sharing ideas around the world, uh, yeah. digital digital creation allows for sharing much quicker. Also, right? Yes, completely correct. Yes. Yep. And then also you find that when you study car design, uh, any car design uh, program that I know of is very international. 
And so you have people from all sorts of uh, walks of life coming there and you can learn from them how they use it and you adapt uh, what you see is interesting from them and you can adapt to your own uh, preferred te techniques. Yeah, which is a good segue to the next question. What, what are some of the uh, standardized uh, 3D programs in the, in the car industry? Um, well, I started with using Alias Wavefront at the time. That's now Autodesk Alias Auto Studio back in the end of 93. And that's been pretty much the standard in, in the car industry so far. Um, there has been a trend now in um, using Maya and other polygon modeling uh, softwares to get um, initial models done. The only disadvantage of that is what I find is a waste of time a little bit is that uh, you can quickly make a model, that, but the model there is a polygon model that you can't use for servicing. So they mill it out and then they have to rescan the mill to, and then they have to resurface the mill with alias again to, to get the proper uh, data, which I think is an extra stage that you don't need. If you, if you know what you're doing with alias, um, I don't think you need to go to that route. Um, but then some people just find alias too complicated to use and they prefer that route. So then, um, uh, perfect. I just a bit, a bit of a waste of time, but that's, that's me coming from my background. Yeah, well, that's that's true. Yeah, I mean, all all the uh, 3D programs are uh, fairly difficult and intense, um, so they take a while to learn for sure. Well, let's put this way: I, I know, from instance, uh, for instance, from the whole menu and alias, that there's a heck of options, but I don't need all of them. I just need a few to make it uh, uh, to to get my model done. And uh, if I know how to use those well, then I'm done. I, I there's I don't need to use the 10,000 10, other options that are all available there because they're, they're not useful for me. Right, right. Yep. So uh, wh where, do you, where do you get your inspiration? I assume it's from other cars and things like that, but where else do you get your inspiration? Uh, also from nature, from, from uh, things that I see. If uh, you can go to, for instance, a, um, um, one second, you can go to a, a movie and then a science fiction movie or something like that and see something really interesting and you think, okay, well, I'm going to use that. And um, that, that inspires you to do something different. Um, so if um, it, it also depends. Uh, if I see other cars, most of the time the cars don't really inspire me, but uh, what does inspire me a lot is uh, then race cars because there's a functionality in their, um, in their design aerodynamics, layout, uh, engineering, packaging, uh, that I find very interesting and very motivating to work with. And then that inspires me to um, uh, try it out in a, in a real car, maybe. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very cool. Absolutely. Yep, yep. So uh, what, what's, what's, the, what's the favorite, your favorite project that you've ever worked on? Um. I've been working, I've been trying since um, 2010. I've been trying to get my own um, brand up uh, on zero emission. Uh, initially, I wanted to do a zero emission uh, super sports car brand and in 2010. And I, um, I'm still, I still hope that one stage that I will, I will make that true, uh, make that happen. But I realize it's, uh, that's why I could answer that whole thing about uh, startups uh, so well. Um, no matter what you try, you're you're always running into problem that you need a lot of money to uh, get done, and the lot of money is just you have to find it. You have to find it uh, somewhere, and that's the part that I find the um, the most difficult part because you can um, one second you can um, try whatever you want and try it as uh, as you like, but if you don't have the the proper finances for it. It's just useless. It's a waste of time. I made for that uh, for that my attempt with my own company. I made complete uh, projections of how much things would cost. Uh, the whole uh, manufacturing process, all the subsequent cars, that derivatives and that sort of thing, uh, factory size and all that sort of stuff. You put a heck of a lot of time in it, and ultimately, the investors have to decide whether they think that what you what you've come up is actually a reasonable proposal, because uh, they have the they have the money, they have the purse. Um, that is so frustrating <laughs> that you wouldn't believe. So that's the part where I think, okay, if you don't have 
if you if you think that you can build a you can build your own car company with hundred thousand dollars, then you should go to the doctor because that doesn't work. That really doesn't uh, work out at all. Yeah. Um, to do a uh, full size prototype, um, yeah, full size driving car. For instance, you spend about two to three million dollars at least, and to um, uh, to get that further developed, it is a heck of a lot more money. You get to pay the engineers, you have to pay the 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 manufacturers of parts and that sort of thing, and that's costing fortunes. So uh, sadly, um, I think a lot of people are underestimating the effort that's uh, required for doing that. Yeah. So one of our uh, Canadian viewers is asking, do you know of a uh, college or university in the Toronto area that teaches car design? I don't know by head. Sorry, I really don't know. Okay. All right. I, but at, at least um, I don't know how far Detroit is from Toronto. That might be a lot of a lot far away, but. At least the the CCS is in Detroit. That's that's uh, pretty renowned. But I assume there's an industrial design college in uh, in the Toronto area. There must be. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there are several. I know um, Sheridan Sheridan uh, College in Oakville and Ryerson uh, in Toronto. I think they have industrial design programs. If you're still listening out there. Yeah, and if you have an industrial design initially, then you can always. Uh, um, specialize into transportation design if you feel like it and that's um, um, then it it also depends on your own motivation if you if you feel really uh, motivated by it you can you can always get it done uh, if you're not really inspired then it's much more difficult that's the thing um, ultimately um, whatever you study you have not only yourself and your qualities but you also have your competition your other students your fellow students and the existing designers there and you have to prove to to uh, the potential employer that it's worth their while to hire you instead of others or uh, complementing others or whatever. Um, that competition is severely there, and you really need to make sure that what you do is uh, interesting to uh, to the employer to actually decide to hire you. Sure. Yep. And somebody has a question here about the Ringling College of Art and Design in Sarasota. You might not know it, uh, core, but I do. I've been there many times, and okay. it's a great school. Uh, I don't know if they have. Uh, I, I guess they do have an industrial design uh, um, part of their school. I know they do illustration, motion, um, animation. Uh, game development, so I'm pretty sure they do all of that. So if you are interested in going to Ringling, it's a it's a great school. So check it out. There's one thing I can uh, I might add to that is that um, if you if you're really interested in car design and you want to do car design uh, as a profession, you have to think about the amount of car companies there are and the amount of um, uh, people that want to become a car designer and um, globally thinking that there is a big chance that you will make it. You have to really uh, stand out and be very, very, very persistent uh, to, to be able to sustain yourself in this industry because you do have that global competition and a limited amount of jobs. So um, in that sense, if there is a, a, a possibility of getting a, a transportation design education, that's perfect, but um, be objective and look at uh, what your uh, fellow students are doing and see if you are really a lot better than them. And if not, then try to improve yourself to make sure that you can actually um, get hired over them. Sure, and speaking of uh, hiring, once somebody does become a car designer, what kind of pay can they expect? Um, that depends on the company and depends on the situation. Um, most of the time, um, companies have, have these uh, uh, structures where they it depends on previous education uh, that they skill you in into a certain level. And then uh, you just go with the, the development flow of whatever the company is doing. Um, that's generally uh, uh, um, pretty consistent. The only thing is they are very special. Then the companies might make exceptions and say, okay, uh, for him we pay extra or for her we pay extra. Uh, because she or he can do this and this. But normally you fall within a normal pay structure. And um, if you then have uh, a master's degree, for instance, you have a pay scale than if you have college, a bachelor's. So uh, that's the only part you have to do. So ideally, if you want to go through to your bachelor's, 
to get the best possible. But then on the other hand, getting a bachelor's here is quite expensive as well. So that's not um, uh, not given for everyone. Right. Cool. Great. All right. I hope that helps, but. Yeah, I mean that that's always helpful. I mean, a, a, any industry. Uh, well, you know, there's uh, there's a limited number of car companies, and there are a limited number of uh, car designers. So it's yeah, a, it's, a, it's a fairly niche business. So I'm sure it's uh, relatively hard to get into. Just on my own uh, account, I've I've been to a couple of the companies, and they they do have a lot of designers at some of the larger uh, car companies. So there's there's more than you know several hundred designers and in some of the bigger car companies. So so there are jobs out there, I'm sure. Yeah, there are do jobs, but you also should realize that you, you don't, um, um, how do you call that? Um, there are levels of the, in the sense of, um, I, I, I'm drawing here complete cars, but most of the time you're starting with a complete car and then it, uh, it, it being developed in the front end and the details and the rear end and the glass house and everything. And everything be designed. So if you're um, if you're lucky, you get to do the whole exterior, the whole form of the the whole form of the interior. Um, and otherwise, you might have to help in your team. You might have to help out and get the um, um, how do you call it? Get the, the the details done on things. And there's nothing wrong with that either. It's just that you might you might put a little bit to the side and say, well, it's for the bigger good of the company uh, that you actually for this. It's not 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 everybody uh, not everybody being given the chance to actually get a, a whole car into production and that they can sign their name onto as the only exclusive designer. Um, these days, there's so much work in uh, um, to be done before you get into production that it's it's pretty rare that you can um, you can claim to be the the main designer of the main theme, but that's it. Most of the time, there's a whole team working um, to get everything done. Yep, that's great. That's great. Okay, well, I'm uh, meanwhile sketching, as you can see, and I'm quickly giving it a color just to see if I can um, get my own magic back and and do some uh, illustration here. Sure, that's great. I'm sure people will appreciate you uh, drawing here. So what I'm done here is I've cut this sketch layer, and I put underneath it a layer. Where I put the the main color of the car, I'm gonna I put in some marker and I'm gonna get some airbrush initially over the fenders. A bit smaller to give a bit of the sculpture away there. So, what do you have any projects you're working on right now that are that are fun and interesting? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> But you're probably not allowed to talk about them, right? No, that's the thing. It's like my clients would not be amused if I would uh, divulge anything from their ideas because, yeah, it's sensitive. That's the biggest problem with the car industry is that everything is uh, sensitive. And um, since it takes uh, as a quick company, it takes about three to five years to develop a car. Um, smaller car, uh, but this more specialized companies uh, take take a lot. Uh, so if you then um, early on already divulge something about whatever you're doing, or if you divulge with one of your uh, um, employees, then they have a big issue. Then all their investment basically is from the note. Oh yeah, no, they're they're it. yeah. Car companies are notoriously very secretive. Yes, yeah. I know. Yes, that's, which that's is very totally true. totally logical. Totally logical. Yeah, it's a it, heck of a lot of investment sense. involved with that. So you don't want to run any risk at all from any people blabbermouthing anything. Uh, somebody's asking if you if people ever use the program Procreate to design cars. Uh, yeah, I've I've said that I've got it on my iPad, um, and I I like it I like it a lot for sketching and it's just for for sketching for two D stuff it's perfect, um, and you can export it out into uh, uh, PSD files to go to Photoshop and then clean it up, um, and then you have a really um, a solid base just like this. This is a free program called Sketchbook uh, from Autodesk uh, that works on the PC and works on the Mac. Um, Procreate works on the Apple iPad and it um, 
on Autodesk, the sketchbook also works on the that as also on the iPad. And I think that is free uh, for Stroke It. I think you have to pay, as far as I know. Which, um, of course, then is not as uh, cost efficient. So how many times as a designer do your designs not get picked up? I assume that's that happens a lot, correct? The majority of the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, um, um, on. Uh, let's put it this way, in a design studio, in a, in a design studio, you have uh, any program, you have about 12 to, to, to 20 designers on a program initially. When, and then uh, uh, when the design is chosen, ultimately, uh, but five to left with that uh, design program and others are design program uh, because there's always other design programs so there's always something else to do and they can't they can't afford to um, have have people just uh, flow do nothing so um, if you if you are really sensitive about that and you really you want your thing to be picked then forget it you don't have a chance you are uh, willing to and always eager to to uh, okay jump on the next jump on the next then um, there's a chance that you actually might get some stuff in, into production well. and do but your, uh, your your company is always the the one that decides and you have very limited uh, uh, what do you call it? influence on it sure and i and i assume that uh, the design process in the car industry there are people that are experts in certain things right so somebody might be an interior designer somebody might be an exterior designer and they're all given different projects correct well first of all that um that's partially true but it's also that as a designer you need to be a little bit more flexible so you you can do both exterior and interior you should be able to be flexible with that but you're um sometimes you have more a tendency to uh, to be better at a certain uh, uh, type of um, design uh, and then your 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 boss will ultimately decide okay you're gonna you're gonna be actually working on uh, interior details or on, on whatever um, that is basically what the the bosses um, decide what, uh, to do the um, your own preference uh, of course is is taken into account but if you're better at something else they would like you to do something that you're really good at instead of uh, struggling with something that they don't really want from you right yeah that's that's great yep uh, it sounds a bit hard it's actually it's logical yeah i think so i think that's logical um uh, we also have a bunch of people that are uh, graduating with different types of uh, diplomas, graphic design, mechanical engineering. Uh, should these type of people um, kind of uh, do something to get into the industry or are they on the right track even though they don't have a, a degree that's specific to car design? Well, again, that's the, the problem with uh, competition. If you're... Um, if you're really good in uh, what you want to do and you're passionate about it and you're um, you're motivated to to learn as much as you can uh, um, on your own then by all means you can do something like that but if you uh, it would be a, a bit risky there's le less risk if you actually just try to after your um, say graphic design course if you then go to um, um, a specialized uh, bachelor's and master's degree in uh, in transportation design uh, first of all for your own experience but secondly for finding uh, potential employers because your employers are most of the time also looking around at those uh, transportation design courses and they will they will always be scanning for new talent and if you're um, if you're that new talent well that that will be ideal and how else are you going to put your work in front of them if you're not at a college That, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, uh, yeah, we, you all have to. It's all stuff that I didn't know when I started it, but uh, I came to learn that uh, the hard way, basically. So. Yeah, practice makes perfect, right? In pretty much yep. everything we do. Yep, always. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, uh, but it's it's a good thing. It's a 
that that means that it prevents it from a lot of crap coming out as well. But um, and and that's the other thing as well. By the when you were when you work on realistic projects, uh, especially when you're at college, um, when your teachers say, "Well, actually, can you do that again?" But then now with this, 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 um, it might not be the funnest thing to hear from your teacher, but be rest assured that they have a reason for saying that, and that uh, you actually doing that and listening to them is actually helping you a lot. Um, I, I know I was in a situation at one stage where I was finished with a presentation rendering for a, um, a course, a race car design program at the uh, World College. And in the evening uh, beforehand, uh, my teacher told me that my perspective was uh, based on a, um, what do you call it? Based on a um, Telelens photograph. And that was off. And could I do that drawing? And I was not really happy, but I must admit I redid it overnight, and uh, it won next uh, next day. Um, it, it's worth it. They 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 don't say that for for just a joke. They actually mean what they say. And they have a good reason for that. Yeah. So people with experience generally are, are there for a reason, right? <laughs> yeah. The teachers at, at are. Uh, normally there for in in your best interest and uh, listening to them is not a bad thing i have to admit <laughs> it was always uh, the funnest thing to hear but it was always uh, correct yeah yeah so what you've seen now the whole time is by the way i'm building up uh, the area as a marker and i'm using a heck of a lot of airbrush to build up the stellar areas basically and then I use, um, I tend to use the blues for uh, the light from the far side to get some cold light in there. And then I use the, um, a little bit of a yellowish, warmer color to get some, some warm warmth over from the rear. So you actually get that, that stuff, that's, uh, that effect that you have in the, uh, in the real world, where you have the sun on one side that gives you the warm light, and then you have the, um, I told you, have the the blue sky, the blue light from the from the far side, and then um, you can make a, you get a better um, perception of uh, uh, of a three D modeled area. Sure. Now, when the when you're designing a car. Um... Do you have to figure out the dimensions? Do you uh, do that on your own, or is, are you usually going off of um, ideas from the company? Um, that depends on on the project. Um, most of the most of the production projects and and concepts from companies, uh, the companies actually supply the package data themselves, so they have it already figured out with the engineers. Uh, there's a limited amount of uh, wiggle room for uh, for your own. Um, input. Uh, most of the time, they they just really know what they're doing, and they they're not uh, they're not making fun. Um, so in that sense, then then you're pretty stuck with what they want you to do. But um, in the cases of um, uh, concepts, wild concepts and that sort of thing, then you can do whatever you want. You can basically uh, go well. Then then it's their their intention, since they probably also have an in in house design team. Uh, where the in-house design team is expected to do something predictable and within the the narrow constraints of the company, um, they want you to come up with something totally different and uh, just shine a fresh light on uh, on whatever is possible. So sometimes we're being used as um, as input from the from the other side just to either stimulate their own designers or to just uh, just to see what what else is possible without it costing too much money. So what is this um, one? I'm going to set the car down on the ground now. Normally there's uh, uh, tools here 
So you can have the, the straight edge and the, the curves, the ship's curve in there to make it um, uh, really tight. Or you can go to Photoshop to optimize it as well. Um, but this is supposed to be a quick sketch, so I just want to quickly bend some some uh, colors in. Yeah, the, sy the, the symmetry tool in Autodesk is really cool too. I love that. Yeah, I love that. Especially and I, if and I, I, think uh, that I think that was initially designed for uh, car designers. That is, let's put it this way. Uh, if it wasn't, it's, uh, it's done a heck of a job because it's really good. And especially, but logically for wheels, you do that. But um, I've over also found that if I want to do a, like a three quarter upper perspective uh, of a car, I've, I love that tool as well, just to, just to ba basically get the, the main shape out from a three quarters top or even top view, and then uh, just uh, play around with that. It's so nice to, uh, to do that. Yeah, for those that have never used uh, Autodesk Sketchbook, it's the, it's the tool, the dotted lines and the squiggly lines there. Yeah, I think Procreate yeah. now has it also in their software. Yeah, I think they do too, you're right, yep, yep. I wonder when, uh, when Adobe will do it in Photoshop, but <laughs> yeah. one hand washes the other, so it always comes somewhere. Yeah, people have been adding to uh, Photoshop for years, so. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can't believe when I initially installed Photoshop, um, I think my computer was installing 25 megabytes, and now it's more 25 gigabytes of data than 25 megabytes. It's like unbelievably heavy. Yeah, it ta it takes up a lot of space for sure. Yeah. Yep. 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 Let me see if I got it this one. I want to clean up the overspray, but I don't seem to be doing it. Uh, Normally, that's the thing. If you have layers, you can name the layers and then um, know exactly where you are when you want to do something. But I didn't do that because I was not paying attention. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is how I quickly set this, this thing up. Um, what were you saying before? You were saying something else. Because um, you want to do the, um, the package layout, tension paper. No, that was it. I think this this might have been it. Yeah. Um, so, oh yeah. What I was going to show as well is um, quickly interrupting. If I now, for instance, have a um, uh, a shape like, yeah. For instance, I I um, just sketching again. I make a um, an aerodynamic shape. I again go to my. Uh, favorite thing where I want the wheels to be um, completely hidden. I just want to, to experiment with the shape a little bit. So I want to have some character lines. That gives me the, a basis to go into alias and to block the, the services in. And when I have the services blocked in, I want to check if that is um, what I want to do or if I want to go somewhere else. So this is, for instance, like a simple layout here. If you look at the section lines, you can see it goes this way, goes in, it goes around. Here it comes down, it goes over, goes down, top, and goes down. And here, again, it goes over this hill, comes down, and goes out here. So this thing, if I now want to block that into alias, and I want to see if I actually have that um, uh, done correctly, I can after from alias. This is I can do this in one service in alias, just pull and push the CVs and get this all done in one uh, one big service, and then I go to uh, uh, VRED from Autodesk, and then evaluate that uh, that shape. So I want to show that really quick how that works. That is on uh, um, this screen. Is that correct? Can you see where the comments come over? Or not yet. Yep, we can see it. Yep. There we go. And then if I have here that shape. Um, uh, it's, I mean, there's the mouse. I hear, I've made that shape quickly in alias. And I put it in my studio. And then if I want to, what do we do normally in the wheel design studio is that you put it under these lights and you want to see how the highlights work, how the highlights run. So in that case, I can go here and switch on my turntable 
and I get inside my computer, I can do all this stuff. So I can really see if I really like what I do or if I just need to alter a heck of a lot of stuff. And uh, I can do all this before ever a mill uh, or a skill model or a model. So this saves me a heck of a lot of time just to experiment. And within this, this rotating turntable, I can look at all sides and see and zoom just like in real life. And I can do in the virtual reality. And I say, okay, well, I like the thickness of the fur, but I don't like how this comes together, this little point. So I need to work on that. And then here, this seems really nice underneath there. How is that going there? See, and that sort of stuff you can you can see in a model, but on a sketch you can you can trick this like crazy. Now here it's already there, so there's no tricking about anymore. It's what you get. So if you don't like it here, you, you can start to end, to uh, change things around now, and then it saves you a heck of a lot of time afterwards, um, and and it saves you from surprises uh, when you get to the uh, to the finished stage. So this was a, a model in Alias that took me about like four hours or something like that to get the right uh, surfaces in. And then uh, it's still a basic, it's basically one surface. And in this, I can just experiment and see, okay, I like that part by the server. Go to the other side now. See, so you can do the variation in the, in the sharpness of radii and everything as well. So you really see what you're what you're doing, and if you want to, you can also change the color and change the transition to green and see if you it brings out different aspects that you didn't want. So you can go to the chrome version. All of these things uh, within Alias and within uh, VWeb. Um, that combined with virtual reality all adds to it that I can make my whole design process much, much more efficient than uh, ever before. And I can really get, when I know, when I get something to a mill, I know that if I evaluate this correctly, I, I, I'm not going to be surprised with what I'm getting uh, out of the mill. It's also uh, great for presenting, right? Because it looks very realistic. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, um, the environment that you build yourself, in this case, is my own uh, design studio area. Um, you can make it, it, if you are working at Forge, you can make a design studio to replicate what you guys have there, uh, or the GM studio or whatever, and then just uh, get whatever you try is what you get ultimately in real life. And that is, uh, that is such a time save. Um, and it saves you from, if you're going to do a presentation to top management, you don't want to have shocks. You don't want to have any embarrassment and that sort of thing. This way you can prevent all of that from happening. For uh, final design work, uh, what applications do you combine? Uh, so be besides Alias and Sketchbook, is there anything else you recommend? That uh, this Autodesk Viva is standard basically at the moment. Uh, there's a tendency at the moment to try out uh, Unreal, but um, to, to be honest, my experience with Unreal is not, uh, not there yet. Um, I've, I've got difficulty importing it from, um, um, from Alias to Unreal, so I still have to figure that out. I think, uh, a, lot but of, I did hear, I think a lot of card designers are using SolidWorks now too, right? Uh, no, uh, SolidWorks is more for industrial design. Uh, okay. SolidWorks has... Um, but as far as I've used it, SolidWorks has issues in the scaling and uh, um, that whatever I do as parts, they uh, seem to appear at the center in my uh, alias data ultimately. And that is totally a waste of time. Um, first of all, secondly, with, a with uh, uh, alias we use, uh, in card design in general, we use such complicated services and such complicated interactions between uh, services that you really want to have um, yeah, you really want to make sure that whatever you get is perfectly uh, acceptable. And in um, um, with the other softwares, I'm not getting it. I'm just not as happy as, as I am with uh, what I get out of Alias. I've tried it also with uh, uh, Maya and with um, uh, other 
from and it's just to me it's much more difficult in in alias i use the services and in uh, i can use the services to um to see the highlights in real time in maya you got all these edges or, or fake radius or something like that that you have to work with uh, there's always something that is not uh, not as consistent as i uh, i would like and, and that's and maybe i'm i'm uh, um, gotten into the habit of alias but for me that there's still the best tool okay that's great thanks does that make sense yeah yeah that makes sense that was that was a good answer i'm sure you answered this gentleman's question so any more questions uh nope Nope, that's good. And I, th I think this has been a great uh, presentation, Cor. Well, thank you. I hope it was interesting. I was actually hoping to finish this thing, but that uh, might be taking too long. Oh, that's, that's okay. Part we, of the... we, we can, uh, you can send it to us later and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do a blog post on your presentation and we'll, we'll put it up online, okay? Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Well, I hope you guys had fun and I hope it was entertaining and uh, informative. And uh, if you have any questions, just uh, contact uh, Wacom and let me know, and I'll uh, get back to you. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, just uh, contact me. You can always reach me at uh, douglas.little at wacom.com, and I can pass it on to Cor. And uh, we thank you a lot for joining us, and thanks, Cor, for spending a couple hours with us to talk about card design. I know we really appreciate it. Thank you. I hope it wasn't too long-winded. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. In fact, we could have kept on going. I was, I was learning a ton, and I'm sure everybody else did. And you were great. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and have a uh, great rest of the week. And uh, stay safe. Talk to you later. Thanks, Cor. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody.